Hello YouTube, it's Barbara Jean. <clears throat> it's just after 8 o'clock in the morning. Looks like it's going to be a decent day today. Um, but anyway, uh, going on with what I was talking about. Uh, <coughs> excuse me, still more cough. I seem to be sitting, just sitting right here. Um, anyway, my last video was talking about Judah and how his repentance had given him the, the blessing over his brothers. Okay. Um, Joseph was of course given a tremendous blessing because he was twice blessed through both of his sons. Um, but Judah was also given the blessing because of his repentant heart. So the power of repentance is huge. Anyway, <clears throat> and the reason why I was going through all this was because I was thinking about how at the time of Jacob's trouble I didn't even cue it <laughs> I didn't mean to I didn't mean cue it here see if I can find it Jeremiah Jeremiah 30 talking about the woman in travail um it's interesting you know god is he's 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 got an interesting way of dealing with his people it's very poetic it's very um well, it's ironic it's humorous god has an interesting way of dealing with people that is uh, beyond our ken anyway <clears throat> the restoration of Israel and Judah is in Jeremiah 30. <clears throat> the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah from the Lord, saying, Thus speak the Lord God of Israel, saying, Write all these words that I have spoken unto thee in a book. For lo, the days come, says the Lord, that I will bring again the captivity of my people Israel and Judah, saith the Lord, and I will cause them to return to that land which I gave to their fathers, and they shall possess it. And these are the words that the Lord spake concerning Israel and concerning Judah. And thus says the Lord, we have heard a voice trembling of fear and not of peace. Ask you, ask you now, and see whether a man doth travail with child. Wherefore, I see every man with his hands on his loins as a woman in travail. All faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. He shall be saved out of it. For it shall come to pass in that day, saith the Lord of hosts, that I will break his yoke off thy neck, and I will burst thy bonds, and the strangers no more shall serve themselves of him. But they shall serve the Lord their God and David their king, whom I raise up unto them. Therefore, fear thou not, O my servant Jacob, saith the Lord, neither be dismayed, O Israel, for lo, I say thee from afar, and I see from the land of their captivity. And Jacob shall return and shall, and shall be in rest and be quiet, and none shall make him afraid. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to save thee. Though I make full end of all nations, whither I have scattered thee, yet I will not make a full end of thee, but I will correct thee in measure. I will correct thee, I will chastise thee in measure. <clears throat> I will not leave thee altogether unpunished. For thus is the Lord, thy bruise is incurable, and thy wound is grievous. There is none to plead thy cause, that thou mayst be bound up, and thou hast no healing medicines. All thy lovers have forgotten thee, they seek thee not. For I have wounded thee with the wound of an enemy, with the chastisement of a cruel one, that's chastisement, for the multitude of thine iniquities, because thy sins were increased. Why criest thou in thine affliction? <clears throat> thy sorrow is incurable, for the multitude of thine iniquity, because thy sins were increased. I have done these things unto thee. Um, that's a long shot. So I wonder if I should just stop there. Anyway, <clears throat> I think I'll just stop right there. Um, 
Uh, Job thir uh, Jeremiah 30, 24, the fierce anger of the Lord shall not return until he has done it, until he has performed the intents of his heart. In the latter days, you shall consider it. So in the last days, this is the last days prophecy. prophecy. And he's talking about chastising them. He's going to return, bring them back to the land, but he's also going to chastise them. Um, but it's the time of Jacob's trouble, and it's talking about men having their hands on their loins, as though they were giving birth. They're going to fear, fill childbirth. On in These men are going to fill childbirth. Jeremiah 36. And now you know whether a man doth travail with child. Therefore do I see every man um, with hands on his loins as the woman in travail. And all vases turn into paleness. Alas, for that day is great. So none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble. But he shall be saved out of it. Um, going back here, I just wanted to show you something that I never saw before. Well, I maybe saw, but I didn't really clue into. I'm just going to make a note of that. Time of Jacob's trouble. I'll just paste that to my notes. Um, back in Genesis, at the blessing of Joseph, um, I mean, Jacob is blessed all his sons in Genesis 49, 7 times 7, 49 is 7 times 7, isn't that interesting, isn't that interesting, hmm. 7 times 7 is 49, <clears throat> chapter 49, Jacob blesses his sons, hmm. I wonder if that's a coincidence, it must be a coincidence, <laughs> anyway, Genesis 50, Joseph died, oh, Jacob dies, and um, I was reading this, Genesis 15, verse 1. And Joseph fell upon his father's face and wept upon him and kissed him. And Joseph commanded his, excuse me, his servants, the physicians, to embalm, embalm his father. And the physicians embalmed Israel. <clears throat> so they embalmed um, Jacob's body. Okay. And 40 days were fulfilled for him. For so, were, so are fulfilled the days of those which are embalmed. And the Egyptians mourned for him three score and ten days. The Egyptians mourned for Jacob seventy days. And when the days of mourning were past, Jake, Joseph spake unto the house of Pharaoh, saying, If now I have found grace in the eyes, speak, I pray, in the ears of Pharaoh, saying, My father made me swear low, I die in my grave, which I digged for me in the land of Canaan. There thou shalt bear me. Bury me. Now, therefore, let me go up, I pray thee, and bear my father, and I will come again. So, Egypt <clears throat> mourns um, for Jacob. It's interesting. Egypt, or basically all of Egypt, and I'm just talking about just the Egyptians, but but it was the Gentiles. It's talking about the Gentiles here. The Gentiles, Egypt, mourned jo uh, Jacob for 70 days. Isn't that interesting? That's interesting. Seventy days they mourned for Jacob. The time of Jacob's trouble. Like I said, there's number seventy keeps popping up, and I'm thinking this is where I'm going with this because I think this is interesting. We got the time of Jacob's trouble. The Egyptians or the Gentiles mourned for him for seventy days after his death and he is taken then to Canaan to be buried back to the land of promise after 70 days that's interesting to me um, getting back to the book of Revelation the church the, the rapture of the church occurs in the sixth seal but before the seventh seal is open in Revelation chapter 7, you see the 144,000 who are sealed with the names of the Father. <clears throat> before the earth can be hurt. And they are from, the 144,000 come from 12,000 from each tribe. And these are Jewish men. They're not Christian men. 
why they're not raptured people because they're Jewish these are Jewish men who are given charge over the planet interestingly enough these hundred and forty four thousand are given charge over the planet <clears throat> for 70 years I'm coming to this conclusion that they are given a time to rule which has been their desire to do so and they're given 70 years the time of Jacob's trouble and it's time of Jacob's trouble because these are the sons of Jacob the blessings that were given to the 12 sons is being played out big time right here <clears throat> Reuben, Gad, Asher, Nephilim, Manasseh, Simeon, Levi, Issachar, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And they are sealed with the name of the Father. And then we see this multitude. We see the raptured church, church in Revelation chapter 7. Okay. Seven. No coincidence. <clears throat> and then we see in Revelation chapter 8, the seventh seal is open. Now you remember, each seal goes with each letter. It's each letter goes with each seal. There is there's a direct correlation between the seals that Christ opens, which is his Q plan. It's his 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 plan to conquer the world and, and make an end to sin is the seals when he opens the seals it begins a dispensation of his victory his conquering and con to conquer and, and conquering he is conquering the world through his plan and every time he opens a seal another plan is developed or another uh, plan is revealed on how he is defeating the enemy um he defeats each with each seal with each letter to the church and each letter with each seal he is conquering the world it's his plan and with a seventh seal he opens and then there's a tremendous there's a great disaster that comes upon the earth remember this the church of philadelphia is safe from this disaster the church of philadelphia has been removed from this disaster but this tremendous disaster happens at the beginning of the seventh church the seventh church age and I believe it's only going to be 70 years on I think it's a 70 year period it's just what's coming to me that this period is the period of the Noahides and Jesus is going to let them have their time to rule and reign they've been longing for it he's gonna let them have it okay because the thousand year reign isn't just the, the reign of the Jewish people it's the reign of both Jew and Gentile together think about that the millennial reign isn't just about the Jewish people it's about the one new man the woman in heaven has just given birth to the one new man and the reign of Christ on earth isn't just about the Jewish reign it's about this Jewish man who's married a Gentile bride and it's about them reigning, reign, ruling and reigning together as one in unity. Okay? That's what it talks about. There's one new man in, in, in the scriptures that talks about how he's going to bring these two and they will become one. The, the rule of the bride and the bridegroom. They will be one. They will rule as one. The male and the female. The, the red and the blue. and the, They become purple. This The ruling. The crowning glory. The millennial reign is about Jew and Gentile together. But Jesus is going to let the Jews have a time to rule the world. And it's going to make, it's going to take 70 years for the spirit of Babylon to finally emerge from their souls. And as a result of it, of these 144,000, he will not lose even one of these 144,000 who are sealed with the name of the Father. They are given a, they are given a task to bring the world back into order after this great disaster in Revelation chapter 8. This is what's coming to me. They are given the task to 
bring the world back into order. This 144,000, they are given, Israel will be given the opportunity to rule the world for 70 years. <coughs> That's not till the last seven years of these 70 years that they're going to finally wake up to the spirit of Babylon that's in them. As you recall, in Revelation chapter 3, the church of Laodicea, they're very rich. It's the spirit of the love of money and the bet betrayal, as you recall, the sons of Jacob betrayed their brother for money. Their love of money outweighed their love of their brother. Judas betrays his brother, Jesus Christ, for 30 pieces of silver. And he didn't repent. It's the same thing with the Pharisees. Jesus spent a great deal of time with his Pharisees. He must have had a, a plan for them. Otherwise, why would he bother? Why would he have bothered to spend so much time arguing with them, trying to bring them to some sensibility of their sinfulness, sensibility of their pride, sensibility of the Judas spirit, the sensibility of the spirit of Cain, that the desire to kill one's brother rather than repent. He must have a plan for them. In the church of Laodicea, he chastises them. He loves them with brotherly love. He doesn't love them with the agape love that he loves his bride with, his church. He loves them with phileo love. Is that a coincidence? It's not a coincidence, people. He loves his Gentile bride with agape love. But he loves the... The Church of Laodicea, the last day's church, with phileo love. And who is in charge, who's given charge over this period of time? His brethren, the 144,000. And they are given charge for, I believe, 70 years. They are given a period of a repentance time of 70 years. This is what I'm coming to. And in this period of 70 years, the, th the third temple will be built. That's what it says in Revelation chapter 3, the church of Philadelphia. What does he say? He says, Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them come and worship before thy feet and to know that I have loved thee. They're going to build that third temple and they're going to worship at that third temple. But God, Jesus still considers some of the synagogue of Satan because they haven't yet repented. It is their unrepented heart that makes them part of the synagogue of Satan. It's the same with us, the Gentile people. If you haven't repented and given your life to Jesus Christ, you're still part of the synagogue of Satan. He, you're not saved. So therefore, you're part of the synagogue of Satan. And he even qualifies the church, um, the Gentile church even more when you go through all the churches and all the way he judges the churches. If you don't do this and if you do this and you do this, okay. But if you don't do this, I'll have your name blotted out. Okay. So there are qualifiers here. And the reason why he calls the the, the Jesus people, not that they, they don't have the lineage of Jewish, not that they, they don't have the Jewish lineage, it's not about that. It's not about not having the genealogy that says you're Jewish, that qualifies you as part of the synagogue of Satan. It's your unrepentant heart. It is the spirit of Cain, the spirit that, 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 that um, kills your brother. Resentment and jealousy and fairness and that's what killed that's what caused Cain to kill his brother that's that same spirit and that's what qualifies you makes you part of the synagogue of Satan not your genealogy but Jesus is going to put them through a testing period and this is the church of Laodicea and it's beginning dispensation 
is when he seals the 144,000 with the name of the Father. And these 144,000 are going to keep the world in line, basically. And I prob they will probably use the Noahide laws to do it. And Jesus is going to give them the opportunity to rule the world for 70 years. But at the end of the 70 years, at the last seven year of these 70 years, you're going to have the two witnesses. And they are going to uh, torment the people for three and a half years. And the people are, because they still haven't repented, they're still in pride, they're still in lukewarmness. They will um, despise these two witnesses who are witnessing against them. And they will kill him. Just with the same spirit of Cain that killed Jesus, they will kill the two witnesses. And when they rise up from the dead, many of them will realize their error towards Jesus Christ. And their error, for course, their error towards these two men who are witnessing about Jesus Christ. But they will also repent of their misconceptions their wrong thinking, their betrayal, their spirit of Cain, and they will repent. And Jesus will not lose even one of the 144,000. The 144,000 will be faithful to the end. And they will not, when, when the woman in heaven gives birth, and they're all going to feel it. The two witnesses come first. They testify for three and a half years. The woman in heaven gives birth and Jacob, Jacob's trouble, that's in Jeremiah. They're all going to feel it when the woman in heaven gives birth. And they're going to acknowledge as Judah, Judah did. Judah acknowledged that the woman was more righteous than he. Whoa, ho, ho, what's going on? Judah is going to, I mean, Israel is going to finally acknowledge that the woman that Jesus loves, this Gentile bride who had the spirit of repentance in her, who was cleansed by the very blood of Christ Jesus and sanctification of the Holy Spirit, was more righteous than they. And they're going to repent for their enmity for the woman of their enmity for the woman, the Gentile bride. And they're going to come to the conclusion that they were sinners and are sinners. And it, they're going to feel this child being born. They're going to feel it in Revelation chapter 12. Satan is going to be thrown down. And then he's going to go after the woman, the, the Christian church that's still left on earth. And they're going to be supernaturally protected. Another witness, another witness that the dragon can't touch her because of her righteousness, because of her righteousness, because of the blood of Christ and the sanctific sanctification of the Holy Spirit will keep her safe. Another witness to them that they were wrong and that the woman was more righteous than they because they were able to receive their brother, Jesus Christ. Oh, this is amazing stuff. Then the beast implements, once he realizes that he can't destroy the woman and that he can't destroy those who are left behind, uh, the Christians who are, who are supernaturally protected, he's going to divide his household and go after his own household and insist loyalty towards him him alone and he's going to implement the mark of the beast okay that is when he does that and the hundred and forty four thousand say no not gonna do it I don't care who you are we've been wrong <laughs> they've repented in their hearts Satan will not have power over them any longer and they will give their lives and not just the hundred and forty four thousand but millions and millions of other people whose eyes have, will have been opened by this 
whole thing, this whole process. And Jesus will sit on a cloud with a sickle in his hand, that's Revelation 14, 14, double seven, double seven, interesting, double seven, double seven. He sits on a cloud, and I looked, and behold, a white cloud, and upon the cloud sat one unto the Son of Man, having on his hand a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. Judah, who his garments are blood-stained, and talks about him having this, this wine harvest for the harvest of the earth is ripe so I'm telling you that's what I'm saying this, the seal the seals him breaking the seals is his cue plan for saving the earth and humanity from Satan's clutches it's his plan it's his salvation plan people Uh, Revelation 18, and another angel came out from the altar, which had the power over fire. And he cried with a loud voice unto him that had the sharp sickle, saying, Thrust in thy sharp sickle, and gather the clusters of the vines of the earth, for her grapes are fully ripe. And the angel suck, thrust in his sickle in the earth, and gathered the vines of the earth, and cast it into great wine press of God's wrath. And the winepress was trodden without the city, and blood came out of the winepress, even unto the horse's bridle by the space of a thousand six hundred furlongs. It's a lot of blood. Once the harvest of the earth has happened, then comes the plagues, the bold judgments that come from his hands. And if you remember in the book of Numbers, Numbers chapter 7, talks 13 times about this bowl that weighs 70 shekels. It's interesting. It's all very interesting. Um, since it pours out his bowl judgment and then it talks about the fall of Babylon. Babylon comes to an end. Finally, Revelation chapter 70, 17, 17 and 18, the fall of Babylon, the whore of Babylon, and the fall of Babylon. We see Jesus Christ uh, riding the horse with many uh, crowns. And he comes and he, he, He's claimed King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He has not claimed that until he has won all his crowns back, taken all the crowns from Satan that he has stolen from mankind. And it's interesting, he ends with the wine harvest. Is what, Jesus, what did Jesus say? He says, I will not drink this wine until I drink it anew with you in the heavenly places. His first miracle was a turning water to wine. I was just thinking about his mother and how let me just see if I can find it. Hold on just a second. That first miracle that Jesus does is in John 2. On the third day, there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. And when they had wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, there, They have no wine. And Jesus said unto her, Woman, what I have to do with thee, mine hour is not yet come. Was he talking about, this is a prophetic word. You think maybe that this is a prophetic word about the time when he will gather his harvest to the wine press. She's wanting, she's, Mary has come to Jesus and said, they have no wine. And Jesus says, my time hasn't come yet, woman. He isn't gathering his wines until the end. At the end, very end, that's when he, gets his wine. He said he wouldn't drink this fruit of the vine until he drinks it anew with you in the kingdom. He, this is the prophetic word here about he, the reason he says this to his mother, he says, it's not my time to get married. My time to get married, my marriage is when I gather that wine press, gather my harvest, that's when it's all completed. That's when the whole thing, it talks about this mar the marriage supper of the lamb, you're invited to the marriage supper of the lamb, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And the mother says to the servant, whatever he says, do it. 
and then they get these six water pots uh, containing uh, these huge water pots, six of them. It's interesting. Oh, why six? And it says, fill these water pots with water, and they filled them. And he said, now draw them out. And when he, he they drew up drew up, drew up the water, it miraculously turned to wine. So, um, and it was better than the wine that they had already been serving. So, um, and it, but it's a wedding. It's a wedding, and he's talking about my hour is not come. I think he's, this is a prophetic reference to the last days when Jesus is going to be gathering his wine to himself at the last days in the Laodicean church. But I do, but what's coming to me though, what is coming to me, and it's quite strong in my mind, is that the seventh church is a 70 year period. They mourned, the Gentiles mourned for Jacob for 70 days. And the time of Jacob's trouble, when they finally come to themselves, when they it's going to take 70 years of this Jewish rule. I believe that's the, this is going to be the time of, that Jesus is going to allow the Jews to rule and reign. And it's going to be a 70 year period. Because like I said, the thousand years isn't just about the Jewish people. It's about the Jews and the Gentiles ruling together. It's through the bride and the bridegroom who are ruling together. But he's got to bring the Jewish people to the understanding that the woman, the Gentile bride, is more righteous than they because they have already come to salvation in Christ Jesus. They already come to repentance. They've already come to sanctification through the blood of Christ. And that repentance and that sanctification is more than enough. But they're not there yet, people. They haven't yet come to that conclusion. They haven't yet come to repentance for for killing their brother Jesus. They haven't yet repented of the spirit of Cain. They haven't yet, they've still got Babylon stuck in their hearts and their minds. And they think if only we can rule, if only we have that opportunity, well, God, Jesus is going to give them that opportunity. He's going to give them the opportunity. But when they when they see the two witnesses, excuse me, killed on the streets, and then they rise up, they're going to feel that child being born in heaven. And they're going to come to the conclusion that the Gentile bride was more righteous than they because they accepted Jesus when they had the opportunity to. But Jesus is going to bring them to repentance and they will have to pay with their very lives, unfortunately. They're going to have to pay with their very lives. They're, by not receiving the mark of the beast, they're going to have to overcome their own system that they've set up for themselves. The Noahide laws, I believe that that's where this is leading. This is, this is an incredible story here. Jesus is showing us, this is an incredible book. The book of Revelation is incredible. The whole book is incredible. The whole Bible is incredible. It's showing us something from the beginning, showing us the end, end from the beginning. Yeah, I, I'm coming to the conclusion that we have started the, 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 the time clock too soon. And it's not, I'm, I, it's not because we're, we're bad people. To be misinterpreted something isn't because you're a bad person. This is because of the time of its revelation hasn't happened yet. Okay, I hope you understand that. We all have misinterpretations because we haven't grown or we haven't gone through the experience. We haven't been gone through. Whatever it is, something hasn't has blocked us being, from being able to clearly see the way things are, you know, see the mystery. But it's the honor of kings to look, search out the matter and, and to solve the mystery. And we, God has given us, kings and queens in his kingdom, this wonderful ability through the Holy Spirit in dwelling in our third eye there, when we're now ready to receive it, that he starts to show us these hidden things that we weren't able to perceive before. And there's nothing wrong with speculating, or, unless, of course, you take the speculation into places that it shouldn't go um, 
that the whole thing I think is just to learn how to trust God he's got a plan he's got a plan people his plan and his seals are not something to fear it was some is God showing this is the next plan this is the next step in my conquering conquering and to conquer the world system and the last to be conquered is the spirit of Babylon which unfortunately the Jewish people are still entrenched in they're still got Babylon in their souls they were taken into captivity all those thousands of years ago <laughs> you know the book of Jeremiah the Jeremiah was you know the, the prophet that was trying to warn them from from Babylon and yet they they couldn't seem to perceive their pride was what was in, in fact wasn't it Jeremiah was trying to say humble yourselves humble yourselves and repent you'll be saved no it couldn't do it and so they were taken into captivity by Babylon because of why because of their pride because of their pride they couldn't bring themselves to humble themselves to let go of their pride and therefore they were taken into captivity by Babylon and what is that what is the last church dealing with the spirit of Babylon that's still in their soul and he's he's gonna take 70 years of their captivity in this, this last days during after this terror when the church is removed and the church of Philadelphia is taken out of the way Christ's bride is removed and they're still going to be they're still the spirit of Babylon is still in them. they still don't perceive that their enmity for the woman and their un un unrepentant heart is what is causing them to still be entrenched in the spirit of Babylon but the spirit of Babylon will rear its ugly head in the last seven years um, it will come to a head when the two witnesses are given three and a half years to, to prophesy and to uh, preach to them and um, then the woman in heaven gives birth and they come to themselves and they're going to feel it they're going to feel that birth and they're going to come to the conclusion the woman in heaven was more righteous than they okay anyway this is where I'm coming to people this is what the conclusion I'm coming to and I wanted to talk about a little bit more I'm just about finished here that this morning I was thinking how um, my thoughts are, I could get my gather my thoughts here for a second <coughs> I was thinking about oh, this escaped me I was thinking about the woman Oh, perfect. That's it. He was going to make his bride without spot or wrinkle. His game plan. Um, remember, um, it says in the book of First uh, Corinthians, it talks about the perfect. When the perfect comes, then that which is in part will be done away with. And the perfect, if what he's talking about in First Corinthians 13 is love, agape love. Find it quickly. In first, first Timothy one seven, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. Um, it does not give us a spirit of fear. There is no fear of God before the... Oh, no, that's not what I was looking for. Um, for you have not... Romans 8, 15. For you have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. Um, it's a spirit of fear that he's removing from his church, which I... Let me see if I can find it here. Um... Hebrews 13 6 so that we have a, so that we may boldly say the Lord is my helper I will not fear what man shall do unto me um hold on let me just see if I can find find what I'm looking for just a second <clears throat> that didn't take me very long just took me a moment first John 4 
Um, Starting at the start at verse 15. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwells in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed that the believe the love that God hath to us. God is love. He that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. Where herein is our love made perfect. That we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Because fear hath torment, he that feareth is not made perfect in love. We love him because he first loved us. So the perfect, the perfect is agape love. And fear is not perfect. There is no fear in love. And the word here, word 18, is in agape. There is no fear in agape. That lover-like love. There is no fear. Um, Jesus has no enmity for the woman. We, the bride of Christ, are coming to that place where we are coming to know that he loves us. And that there is no fear in us for our lover, Jesus Christ, who loves us with that lover-like love. There is no fear. What his plan is, is to remove the fear from our hearts. He, when he opens a seal, it's another, it's, we've overcome, we've overcome, we've overcome another level of fear, another level of fear. So he's like, he's, he's, he allows Satan to do his worst because that's when God does his best. You understand what I'm saying? When he releases the hounds of hell to do their worst, on mankind it's when God does his best because we are still standing in Christ hold on let me just find the verse I think it's in is it Romans Romans I think Romans 8 Romans 8 I think it is Romans 8, 1, there is now therefore no condemnation in those who are Christ Jesus who walk after the flesh but after the spirit. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ hath set me free from the law of sin and death. That is freedom from fear there. For what the law could not do, it was in that it was weak through the flesh. God sent his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh, for sin condemned sin in the flesh. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Okay, let me just go down here. Um, and if Christ be in you, the this is verse 10, the body is dead because of sin, but the spirit is, in, is life because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him that raised up Jesus from the dead dwell in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken your mortal body, bodies, but this, his spirit that dwelleth in you. Therefore, brethren, we are not debtor, debtors, not to the flesh, nor to the flesh, to live after the flesh. For if you live after the flesh, you shall die. But if you through the Spirit do mortify the deeds of the body, you shall live. <laughs> For as many are led by the Spirit of God, they are sons of God. You have not received the Spirit of bondage, again to fear, but you have received the Spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. There it is again, that crying, Abba, Father, that releasing of fear. Um, and if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ. If, if so be that we suffer with him, that we might also be glorified together. And this is the part I really want to get to. For I reckon that the sufferings in this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed to us. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made sub subject to vanity, not willingly, not willingly, but by reason of him that hath subjected the same in hope. Because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Not only they, but also our, ourselves also which have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves waiting for the adoption 
to wit the redemption of the body, for we are saved by hope. But hope that is seen is not hope. For what man seeth, why does he yet hope for it? But if we hope for that which we see not, then we do with patience wait for it. Likewise, the Spirit also helps us, uh, helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit itself make intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Going down, I want to go down here um, to um, verse 31. What shall we say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? That's the main thing. If God be for us, who can be against us? No matter what Satan is unleashing at us, nothing, nothing can separate us from God's love. His perfect love casts out the fear of man, of what man unleashes on man. The Cain spirit, spirit of Cain, cannot defeat. Think about it. Cain killed his brother. But the spirit of Cain can't kill God's love towards us. And that casts out our fear. What shall we say of these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? He that spared not his own son, but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not be with him who freely gives us all things? Who shall lay anything anything to the charge of God's elect? It is God that justifies. Who is he that condemneth? Is it Christ that died? Ye ra ye ra it is Christ that died, ye rather, that is risen again, who is he excuse me, who is even at the right hand of God, who, who also make his intercession for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation, or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? So all the things that Satan unleashes against us, that makes us take our eyes off the heavenly prize, and has us looking around, like Peter, on the troubled sea, has us looking in fear, oh, we we got to take our eyes off the world and what the world tries to unleash against us, the hells, hounds of hell that, that Satan unleashes towards us. And keep our eyes on the prize and keep our eyes on that heavenly hope. And that's what removes the fear from our heart of what man and what man tries to do unto other men. We are conquerors when we no longer fear what man can do to us. That's that's what makes us perfect. That perfect love casts out fear. Who is that he that condemneth? Is it Christ? It is Christ that dies, yea, rather, that is risen again, who is even the right hand of God, which who also makes intercession for us. Who shall separate, separate us from the love of Christ? Who can separate us from agape? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword, as it is written, for for thy sake we are killed all the day long. We are counted as sheep for the slaughter. Nay, in all things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And what is the, the Q plan? He opens the first seal. And the one who's going forth is going forth to conquer, conquering and to conquer. It is Christ on that white horse who opens the seals and unleashes basically the hounds of hell on his sheep in order to what? To remove the fear from of man from our hearts. We know that in Christ Jesus, by resting in him and trusting in him and hoping in him, that that removes the fear of man from us. That's what he's trying to do. He's trying to remove that fear, because perfect love casts out fear. When you love Christ perfectly, you have no fear. That makes sense? And 1 Corinthians, when the perfect has come, he will do away with, we will no longer see through a mirror darkly, we will see through a mirror clearly, because we'll be able to see the plan when we're our faces are face to face with, with God and we're seeing him face to face. We shall see him as he is and we shall be like him. Christ had to trust the plan. When God sent him to this earth to live as a man, 
and die on a cross. He had to trust the plan. And it was, wasn't was a good thing to do. I mean, look at what he had to face. He had to face a cross. He had to be he had to be whipped. He was whipped. He was score he was scorned by his brethren. He was rejected by his brethren, those whom he loved. He had to face a tremendous amount of torment and scorn and and horrible things he had to go through. Being spat on and hit and abused. And yet he trusted the plan. Because he knew that in his agape love for his father, that nothing could separate him. So therefore he had no fear of man and what he could, what man could do to him. And so his perfect love, Satan did his worst, but God did his best. And the same thing for us when Satan's doing the worst all around us. We have to keep our eyes on Christ and that trust and hope that we put in him no matter what's going on around us it's casting out that fear that's in our heart fear of man fear of satan fear of the future fear of death fear all that stuff has gone away because there's nothing satan can do to separate you from god's agape nothing I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor angels nor principalities nor powers nor things present nor things to come no heights, nor debts, nor any, or any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, from the, the agape of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. That is really the end game. That is the purpose of the seals. It's Christ conquering our fear. That's really what it is. It's Christ conquering our fear of man and of Satan and of depths and heights and angels and principalities and all these things he's conquering the fear in us so that we are like him fearless because that's the perfect because perfect love casts out fear he is leading us to agape which means fearlessness trusting trusting the plan trust the plan people that's what he says that's what he says to the, the Grace Church. Trust the plan. Take your eyes off the world and keep your eyes on the prize, which is Jesus Christ. Keep looking up or you're going to miss it. Work on your own salvation and getting yourself cleaned up. That's what he says to the church of, of the Grace Church. Keep your eyes looking up or you might miss it. Don't take your eyes off the world and keep your eyes looking up to Jesus Christ. He's got the plan. It's in his hands. Take your, uh, Allow him to, to set you free from your fears. So like Job said, the thing I feared the most has come upon me. God allowed Job to experience his fear in order to set him free from it. I know in my own life, how many things I've gone through, there's, I've been really, really scared. I've, been, I've lived through a lot of fearful things in my life. But if we allow God to set us free, we're set free. We are, we are healed by our, the afflicted are, are healed by their affliction. When you allow God to take you through the process, you will be set free because you keep 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 your eyes on Christ. No matter what's going on around you, no matter what's happening in your life, no matter how you feel, because feelings can be deceptive. You keep your eyes on the prize, and He sets you free from your fear. His perfect love casts out your fear because there's nothing that can separate you from his love. Anyway, that's what was going through my mind this morning when I started all this. This morning I started thinking about this love and then I, I started going on this other tangent with, with Judas. But I think it's an interesting tangent. And uh, right now, that's what they he's going to bring his, his own people through. I believe they're going to have a 70-year period. I believe that they're going to have a 70-year period in which they will allow, God will allow them to rule and reign. And they will come to the conclusion at the end of it that the woman that Jesus Christ had redeemed was more righteous than they because they trusted in Christ Jesus. Because they put their her faith and her faith and her hope and her love 
in Christ Jesus. And therefore, she was more righteous than they. It will be a huge revelation for them, but they're not there yet. Okay? And that's why I believe it's going to take 70 years for them to realize it. This is what the Bible says. It's going to take 70 years to make an end of iniquity. Let me just find that for you. Hold on just a second. I'm going to see if I can find it, and then I'm going to conclude this video. It's Daniel 9. It says, um, And in the first year of Darius, the son of Asarerus, the seed of Medes, which is made king of the realm of the Chaldeans, in the first year of the reign of I, in the, his reign, I, Daniel, understood by the books of the numbers of the years, whereof the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah the prophet, that he would accomplish 70 years in the desolations of Jerusalem. 70 years. And it is to bring an end to their iniquity. Anyway. I think that's all I need to say for now. Um, it's just something, like I said, I, some thoughts going through my head. <laughs> I always wake up with these thoughts, and if I don't get them out, then, then they end up piling up, and then I end up with extremely long videos because I have uh, let them go too long. But anyway, um, yeah, I hope this is giving you some food for thought, but uh, I'm coming to the strong conclusion that the Jewish people will be given 70 years to rule and reign. And in the end of it, they will be set free from the spirit of Babylon. Okay? But uh, this is not until after the rapture of the church. The rapture of the church occurs. There's a terrible de devastation of the world. And uh, these 144,000 Jewish men are given rule and reign. And they'll do a good job, I think, for the first part until the last part, until they realize that the spirit of Babylon is still in them, and the uh, it'll rule it, rear its ugly head with the last uh, seven years with the Antichrist. And anyway, anyway, that's all I need to say. God bless. I'll talk to you later.